We're here at a really exciting time to talk about television. It seems that there is an abundance of riches, um, constant talk of what's new and exciting and unmissable and the best thing on TV at the moment. Um, it's exciting as someone who writes about television or for someone who writes about television. It's also um, a bit exhausting because <laughs> it seems like you can never be on top of everything that's around and the great new thing that someone's seen that you've never heard of and it's a bit mortifying that you've never heard of it. So I will um, begin for me by apologising in advance for what I have not yet seen. <laughs> Um, I have a feeling up here between us we all watch a lot of television, um, but we may not have been watching the same things. And um, one of the reasons that I may not have been watching some of the things that my fellow panellists have been watching is that literally today we finally signed on for Netflix in my house <laughs> and we only just managed to get the stand hooked up three days ago. So, my experience of streaming is probably very different from some of the panellists tonight, who I would now like to introduce to you. Sitting immediately to my left is Craig Matheson, who is my fellow television critic at the Age Green Guide. Um, we share a column called Hindsight and we alternate weeks, and he's also the film critic for the Sunday Age. Um, sitting next to Craig is Luke Buckmaster, who is film and TV critic for The Guardian Australia and for The Daily Review. And over on the other side of the panel is Stephanie Van Schilt. She's the editor of Lifted Brow, co-host of the Rereaders podcast and former TV columnist for Kill Your Darlings. Stephanie's also written for various publications such as Metro, Crikey, Junkie and The Big Issue. I thought I would, given my confession about the lack of streaming access in our house, I thought maybe we would start by talking about what we've all been watching and because of my streaming deficiency, the main things I have been watching are on uh, pay TV on Foxtel and on free-to-air TV. So in our household, it's been The Nick, The Americans, season two, not season three, um, yet, The Affair, Mad Men, Togetherness, and The Game. And on free-to-air TV, it's been Empire, The Good Wife, How to, Get Away with uh, How to Get Away with Murder, and The Graham Norton Show, which I never miss. So I would like to now ask my fellow panelists, what have you been watching? Oh, that is a hard question because your list was really good and I feel bad now. Um, so I'm just going to... Mission accomplished. Yeah. Look, let's be honest, we're all going to try and one-up one another um, so we've seen better things. Um, look, what am I watching uh, this year? It's been Transparent on Stan, which I think has been the best show I've seen this year. Mozart in the Jungle. Uh, I do watch some reality television, partly for work, partly for pleasure, partly because I perhaps hate myself. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I've seen things like The Block and My Kitchen Rules, uh, The Game on Foxtel, of course, Game of Thrones, uh, Wolf Hall, which I think is outstanding. Um, and on the comedy side, uh, I'm just catching up with Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix. Okay. And Luke? Well, you know, in regards to Netflix, I'm one of those people who've only recently signed on to Netflix, so I never did that VPN unlocker thing. So when I log on to Netflix now and, and over the last month, been sort of exposed to all these terrific exclusive Netflix programs that are only available, you know, in that, on that platform, uh, which is a great kind of um, a bona fide for, for Netflix. So I've been going through Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, like, like Craig has, which I think is a fantastic sitcom. I think it's one of the best sitcoms to come out of America in several years. I completed the, the first season of Daredevil uh, last weekend. I smashed through the first uh, 13 episodes of them and binge watched them. Um, which I tremendously enjoyed as well. Uh, I started watching a, a show called Blood, Bloodline, um, and Ben Mendelsohn plays this dark menace that arrives at a, a well-to-do family who own a hotel on the coast and brings with him all these crimes and misdemeanours and, and things like that um, into, I think, uh, episode eight or, eight or nine uh, for Bloodline. Also, Did you say you started it last weekend? 
and yeah. And you're into episode eight or nine. Yeah. I feel that. I feel yeah. that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> uh -huh. And on the same weekend, of course, I also watched all of uh, BoJack Horseman. Yes. Uh, and that's a, that's a nice little <laughs> animation with Will Arnett as the voice of an out-of-work horse in Hollywood. Alcoholic <laughs> out-of-work horse in Hollywood, too. So it's, yeah. it's right up my alley <laughs> for some reason. Okay, you've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie. Um, recently, so I've watched kind of a few of, like I've already watched Project Horseman. I'm, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble by saying I do have a VPN. And I... Well, grey area. Yeah, I mean, gray, you're not yeah. saying I'm downloading mass amounts of everything I want to see whenever I want to see it. So Yeah, so I've, I use Netflix and I have for a little bit. You use um, and you can get American Netflix or English Netflix. Don't incriminate it. Uh, yeah. <sighs> but it's not... As I understand it, the purchase of a VPN is not something illegal, is it? You can tell that to George Brandis. No, no, it's not, it's I'm not, not illegal. Anything it's to not illegal. George Brandis. I think it's a badge of honour, actually. It's basically saying, I'm going to work damn hard to pay you for a service. That's what I think as well. And particularly if yeah. you're um, going to be critically engaging in it here, which is hard, we can't exactly access networks and ask for screeners, screeners or the like. So. Um, that's how I justify it. And I do pay. Um, most recently, I obsessively binge watched The Fall, um, which is an intense crime drama starring the guy from Fifty Shades of Grey being actually amazing, and um, Gillian Anderson. And that's something that I could binge watch even though it was intense and a lot of people couldn't watch it. I can't binge watch cringe shows for some reason. They just like panic attack level. Um, also, Orphan Black, um, I recently caught up with that because I heard a few people talking about how great it was and that's a show about clones and one woman plays nine different versions of her clone and it's pretty, like, it's kind of trashy on the Buffy alias spectrum of things but it's um, really great viewing so they're my latest obsessions but then I kind of keep up to date with, because I have the VPN, I can now watch uh, Community on Yahoo which is contributing to their stats. Um, so, n not that it's as great as it once was, but I'm a dedicated community lover all the way. Mm. So, yeah, I try and keep up to date with a few things. But So, when you watch Orphan Black and The Four, which are both on SBS, you don't watch them on the free-to-air TV way? I, uh, yeah, I, I know. It's but, but that's a choice. Yeah. Why? Because it's more about scheduling television around my life rather than television scheduling my life. Like, you know what I mean? So when we used to have to rush home to watch something or we'd record it on a VCR or like all of these kind of things, now I'm just like, I can watch it when I'm ready to watch it. And that might be in one Saturday afternoon, all eight episodes in one hit. And I think that that's definitely, yeah, a plus for me. But So this, this way of watching, the binge watching, because we're told with food, binging is bad and we're supposed to be moderate and not gulp everything down but but just you know enjoy it savor it but with tv somehow it's become yeah give it all to me in one big hit so is do you binge watch a lot i feel like i'm asking like you know <laughs> it's a terrible question are we having an intervention and and has it changed the way we watch tv and is it a way you like watching tv i guess for all of you not always. I mean, I think a lot of us started binge watching with DVDs, mm -hmm. where you would get the series, of, and you might get the series from Amazon um, of something that had been in America, and you know that Channel Nine had shown the first three episodes of at two in the morning. So you would, and you would binge that. So I think mm. we've, we've been, we've sort of grown our binge capability. I don't always like it, um, but I think it just reflects. You know, we're at the probably the end of the era when television is a linear event. And television is now an on-demand event, so you know it's it's each person to their own moderation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can I can imagine it gets a little ugly at four in the morning when you just you know that sort of mantra of one more episode, <laughs> one more episode. I think I think that's the key to it, the 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 choice element, right? So when you say binge viewing, it's not about watching a show again and again and again and watching every episode in a row again and again. It's about having the option of watching whenever you like, when you want it. So is it a good thing? Of course it is. I can watch it uh, one once a week. I can watch it twice a week. I can watch it like I did last weekend, for example, thirteen times in a row. Um, uh, you know, so it's it's all about um, having that that freedom and that choice. It's it's a no brainer. It's, it's Fantastic. Is it healthy for you? 
physically? Well, yeah, well, no, of course not. <laughs> uh, is it healthy for you mentally? Well, it depends what you're watching. But don't you worry that we're also getting, we lose that sense of community? I kind of, I like, as, and I'm, perhaps I'm old-fashioned, but I like that idea that a large amount of people around the country do the same thing at the same time and then talk about it the next day. You know, I, I kind of miss having that feedback or that conversation. I, I do get watching it when you want, and I love that. But I kind of sometimes just miss that the, the sense of community that comes with being a television viewer on, on, on an old-fashioned schedule. I feel like there's trends, though. So certain people will pick up shows. So The Fall, I came along to watch because a lot of people in my life had watched it and recommended it or were watching it and they couldn't talk to me about it and then I went and it was something that I wanted to watch anyway because it's the whole dead girl drama thing that I'm very interested in um, and being like now I've watched it all I can sit down and talk to them about it um, and I think that's something that I've, everyone's kind of noticed shifting where years ago people would sit down and perhaps talk about the last movie they saw but if you're sitting in a cafe now you overhear people talking about what tv shows they're watching or have watched and i think that sense of community is still there it might just be a bit more disparate perhaps but don't you think perhaps you felt pressured in a way that you to be included to i'm just, I'm just you know speculating but because your friends were having these conversations did you almost feel you had to no, it was more of a kind of qualification. So if we have similar tastes, then it's mm -hmm. like, oh, that might be of interest to me. And then I will talk to them about it. Plus, I'm kind of the most TV nerdish of my friends. I'm like, how do you know something that I don't know? <laughs> Incorrect. Yeah. I think having that, having that recommendation from friends to watch something is a much more compelling reason to watch something than simply because it's on at a certain time. Absolutely. So I think mm. while, yeah, I completely take your point, while I think there's a, there's, a, there's a massive appeal in watching something and knowing that a whole lot of other people are watching, we're now in a stage where the word community in terms of TV has been replaced by zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. So it's still there, it's just operating on a longer timeline. We start talking about Breaking Bad, whatever the show is, um, that conversation lasts for, for weeks and months and goes in peaks and troughs. So the, the community element is still there, it's just kind of tangentialised and, and spread out a little bit. Don't, don't you think part of Game of Thrones' appeal is that it, it is that weekly segment? Do you think Game of Thrones would have the same impact if they put all ten episodes up for streaming straight away? That's a particular style of television show as well. So when you binge watch, you might not necessarily want to watch something that's that in-depth. So they're quite dense long episodes at a time so you might be like two comedies 20 something minutes smash them out watch them all have a lol good times <laughs> like yeah but i kind of feel like it's like reading a great book mm -hmm. sometimes i mean maybe people are making different television differently now but it's almost like an episode say of a Mad Men. it was like a perfectly crafted piece of a bigger puzzle but i didn't want to gulp three of them down at once i just wanted to watch one at a time and see what the differences were between different chapters and then how they fit together. Does If you binge it, and not in the sense of that you've described it, which is great, which is binging is you decide when you want to watch it and when, and if you want to watch all 13 episodes, you can, but if you want to watch, and this is my favourite approach, one a night, like have a whole lot of them to look forward to over consecutive nights, that's great. But if you gulp it all down, do you not miss the subtleties of, of something or the, you know, the differences? Do you kind of get to the end like a big junk food binge and think, Bleh, it's finished and Ugh, I don't feel that great? Uh, I think it depends. No. I, I get, no, I guess I think it also, de again, depends on the show and the person. Yeah. I'm a, a kind of obsessive person, so I'm like, I need to know more, I want to know more, and I continually do it. Um, I also think that TV is now, I think th this came up on one of the emails that we were sending around to each other, is structured for people mm. to binge watch it. So they're creating shows for people to catch on to that last cliffhanger and be able to click on to the next episode. Um, I also think that the choice and all of these community elements that we're talking about has also created a bunch of television that marginalised voices have been able to input into or they're about marginalised people, so like transparent, there's a lot of kind of female-driven shows and mm. I think that that all feeds into it. So I think that it's hard to say binge watching, yay or nay. I think it's mm. complex and, and way more layered than I that. think the only thing we can agree on is that television's never been in a greater state of flux. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for better or for worse. I mean, the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, you, as you mentioned, Transparent or Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are shows that we watch casually now 
that if you're of a certain age, you could never have imagined seeing a television show like that because you grew up with five channels or even four channels. Mm -hmm. Or if you grew up in the country at a certain area, you grew up with two channels. And, you know, the thought of the breadth of television we have now is incredible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're either too young to truly appreciate it um, or you're just trying to keep up. But it, television, the change is immense in terms of content and breadth. Yeah. Is that one of the reasons it's so exciting now? It's because of the range of places that... I mean, the, the figures that you sent me in that um, New Yorker story about the massive explosion mm -hmm. in the number of, of programs on television, it's something like... I mean, I think I've got it here. The, the numbers are just incredible. Um, something light, like a 683% growth in the number of new primetime scripted cable shows um, since the turn of the century. And the number of new primetime scripted cable shows has doubled in the past five years, tripled since 2007, and grown by this 683% since the turn of the century. That's just America. Yeah. So there is this explosion of, of um, coming through the streaming services now, Amazon, place Netflix commissioning their own original product. Has that made it more diverse and more exciting? Oh, I think so, but yeah. I, that article that you're speaking about was Emily Nussbaum on The New Yorker talking about Better yeah. Call Saul, um, which I haven't seen yet, the spin-off from Breaking Bad. And she was just talking about television triage as a critic. So yeah. feeling like you're supposed to be an expert as someone who navigates and controls kind of an element of the cultural conversation, but can never be an expert on it because it's actually impossible to have watched all of those programs. Like, there's literally mm. not enough hours in anyone's life to do that. Mm. Um, I think that we are talking here this evening from a particular bubble and perspective. We're all obviously critically engaged with television. We're not speaking about different socioeconomic demographics who might not even know what Netflix is. The other day I was walking into uni and there were two girls behind me and one of them was telling her what Netflix was and the other girl didn't know. And that's Gen Y and doesn't Gen Y know everything? Like, I think that we come across it from a particular perspective. Um, mm. I think that it's easy to make these big calls at this time. Mm. Third golden age, second golden age, broadcast is dead, all of that business. But I think it's far more complex than that because TV is a popular medium mm. and you're never going to know. Uh, I, I think it is exciting, not, not just for the reasons that you've mentioned, but for the reasons that if you're comparing streaming services and free-to-air TV, right, mm. uh, the, the proliferation of the streaming services means that you're pushing people further and further away from the dial. And once you push them further and further away from the dial, you're not just changing the way the audiences watch that content and interact with it, you're actually changing the way the content is structured. So, for example, mm. last year, um, Samantha Lang, an Australian filmmaker, made, made two movies. Um, or telly movies, I should say. One of them was The Killing Field for, for Channel 7. Now, that show is made with the commercials in mind. So it's essentially nine or ten different short films. This is how filmmakers often regard these, these programs that are made very specifically for commercial networks because obviously um, their, their business model is contingent on selling a certain number of ads to a certain number of eyeballs. Now, the other movie or telly movie that she made uh, last year was a much better telly movie. It's called Carlotta. And that was on ABC. It got 1.1 million viewers, another very respectable figure. When you start looking at those kind of programs on streaming providers, you're changing the way that these shows are being engineered. And one of the interesting, um, I think, factors of this Bloodline show with, with Ben Mendelsohn is that you've got a very fluid narrative trajectory that goes over, you know, along with episode eight, I assume it goes over the entire season. So while that, 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 that show has changed the structure, it also understands things like a cliffhanger ending. Because when you get to the end of a Netflix um, show, you're given 20 seconds on that autoplay, the 20 seconds before the next episode starts. Sometimes so they've got to end strong, they've got to start strong. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you can change that too. You just go, like, hit yeah. the button. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> really hard. And that, that, that autoplay changes, you know, it's a small technical thing that Netflix are doing that the other streaming providers aren't doing. And I think that's a really excellent example of a very small, it's almost like the Facebook like button. It's a very small element that can have a potentially profound effect on the platform. Hmm. Where does all this leave? You mentioned Carlotta and Killingfield. Given the sort of stuff we were talking about watching, I didn't register or maybe I missed it a lot of local productions in there and certainly 
the levels of local content required, say, on pay TV are lower than free-to-air TV, and on the streaming services, that's probably not the main reason people pay their subscription, well, pay up for them. Where does this change in the way we're watching TV and all these new options leave the local TV industry, do you think? Well, I think the, I think the free-to-air networks, the commercial ones, are you know, just increasingly focused on, I think the figure is there's a 65% figure of audiences that like what they're doing, you know, that are happy with, with the sort of those blocks of reality television that are sort of their, that sort of monolithic slabs of it almost that just go through pretty much through the whole ratings period. You know, and I think free to wear television in this country, in the commercial networks is gonna get sort of more conservative because they're, they're gonna be about maintaining that block of 65% of the people and just giving them whatever they want. And I think they're willing to write off a certain amount of viewers to Netflix, to Stan, to any sort of streaming service, to SBS or the ABC if they try something different, um, which I think will probably backfire on them. I mean, to me, some of the most interesting shows in America have been the big American networks trying to do things differently. I mean, you see a show like Empire, mm. which I think is aimed, comes out of the African-American community, um, probably also brings in a lot of African-American audience that is um, you know, not perhaps as committed or interested for various reasons in streaming. So you know, there are interesting shows like that that I think the mainstream is capable of really interesting things, but I'm not sure the mainstream in this country will sort of embark on that path. I think they'll be more conservative and try and maintain their sort of holdings and sort of hold on for year after year. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and when, we, when we talk about this new TV golden age, you've got to remember that there is no TV golden age for Australian mm -hmm. TV. It's completely passed us by or we just haven't got there yet. It does not exist in Australia. We're, we're about MasterChef and, and getting, you know, getting the most amount of people at, the, at a certain time to watch the show. It's, it's a pretty basic business model. The, the shows that I feel are probably the most suited to, to streaming um, providers that Australia has made are shows like The Moody's and, and Rake, um, Chris Lilly's stuff, uh, Redfern Now, they're all, they've all got one thing in common, that they were all broadcast on the ABC, and really they were already on streaming provider because iView has been around for some time. So it's, um, I think it's important to bring iView into this discussion of what is a streaming uh, TV provider, certainly in Australia, but yeah, we're, we're not even close to, to getting to a golden age of TV in Australia. In fact, we're, we're sort of way behind. And on the question of, um, you know, why did Netflix not commission local content when it started up in Australia? Well, you know, those people are gathered around a meeting table and they're looking at the stats and they're looking at you and 250,000 other people in Australia who, who bought a VPN, have bought their service with no Australian content. So they start talking, well, do it, should we commit? No, we actually don't need to because Australians aren't really interested in Australian content yet. And we're not obliged to. Mm. Mm. The best Australian show I've seen this year was Gallipoli, and that's going to be famous mainly for the fact that very few people watched it. Mm. In my own defence, <laughs> <laughs> I do watch things on iView, and that's the other way of watching things at, on my own time. Um, mm. Please Like Me, Josh Thomas's show that was out last year was great. The Code I really liked. Mm. Um, what was my other show? Uh, I, and I watched on iTunes um, Party... Oh, what was it? Party Tricks. Is that what it's called? Party yeah. Tricks. Yeah, yeah. The um, short-lived Channel 10. Yeah, yeah. Asher and Petty. all of those shows. Yeah. So, it, bar Please Like Me. So, the other two were kind of one-season things and they didn't get enough ratings when they were on so they weren't continued. Um, I tried in that case. <laughs> but I also think we have to remember that it's really hard to compare our industry to the international industry. We're a completely different thing. We're funded majority by government, most of, like... I know that's film as well as TV. A lot of the stuff has a lot of investment via those avenues. We were talking about having, what, like four, five, sometimes three networks to tune into. We don't have all of those stats that Emily Nussbaum talked about. So we do seek other cultural activity and now we have it to add out like fingertips via online services. Why wouldn't we access it? I think that it's kind of hard to blame here, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a really complicated thing, I really do think. Well, if it's a global audience, which I think, you know, Netflix thinks in global terms of their numbers. So if you were a young creative in this country and you wanted to make television, I assume you would get on a plane. And, well, that's... And, and move, move to LA. Move and there are a lot and, of and Australians pitch, mo uh, like moving there, and yeah. working. Yeah, yeah we're absolutely. losing, we, we've got to, you know, we're losing them like we lost, uh, you know, 
riders to London in the 1950s. It's the same thing. You know, the opportunity isn't here and they're going. Gosh, that's bleak. Well, the, the international component also flips the other way, right? So you can also go, well, we could do an Australian program here that would be beamed all around the world via Netflix. Mm. So if they commissioned the right show with a good cut-through appeal, it could be, you know, it could, could go gangbusters everywhere. Something like a mm. Wolf Creek TV adaptation, something like that. I, imagine. I think Dance Academy did quite well on the international Netflix. Chris Lilly, I think, yeah, and Chris Lilly. Through, through his ABC shows. Is there anything locally made that you watch with the same sort of excitement that you approach... I don't know, Unbreakable, Kimmy Schmidt, or um, The Fall, or Orphan Black. Is there anything local at the moment that you think gets you that excited about the prospect of watching it? The 7.30 report, not sure. <laughs> report. Um, probably Red Fern Now. I think that was a, that was a really terrific show, and that had a, a, a wonderful um, send-off with the telly movie. But no, not for me. Not really. Watching other people watch local free-to-air TV. My old housemate used to watch Q&A, and that was a really funny thing to watch her really engage with that. I thought you were going to talk about Gogglebox. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it was a live version of that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, not no one's not even going to say Real Housewives of Melbourne. Deep oh, my God, yes. Even no, to get I a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt as being one of the, the more outstanding programs you've seen recently. Why? I haven't seen it yet. I can now, soon. What's great about it? Well, I think for, for one thing, right, so for one thing it demonstrates what a show can look like when it's not written by white men. That's, that's, that's one thing, right? So it's, it's got a, a, a lot of really strong female characters. It's got a lot of interesting and diverse characters, like you were alluding to before. Um, it's also um, an edgy and, and provo provocative show in a way. It's very sharp. There's, there's a gag every two or three minutes. NBC were, were, had that in their, their lineup, and they essentially shelved it. And Netflix came along, picked it up. Not only greenlit um, the show for, for running on, on online or from the streaming service, but but also gave it an okay to a second season. Um, in terms of what makes it really good and really distinctive, uh, I guess that's up for people to decide um, naturally. But uh, there's nothing that's quite like it. So it's Can it's I, saying that it is by Tina Fey. You've obviously seen Thirty, 30 Rock. Rock. Yep. Do you not think that it's? Oh sure, but I mean, I was talking about more of the premise of somebody coming up from a doomsday cult underneath the ground and discovering life again. Which that is Real Housewives of Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're still in the cult. <laughs> Which is a really good way of doing a fish out of water comedy without really making it a fish out of water comedy because you know, she's just been kind of bobbing down below the surface and she hasn't, you know, it's not like Crocodile down there where they fly off to another country um, or, you know, can't speak the language like Barat. She's just been sort of in a time warp, then comes up and it's got this element of the twilight zone to it where she's just sort of learning um, life again and learning culture and what happened when the internet started. And I think that's a very easy way or a very effective way for the show writers to create a whole stream of gags. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I like it anyway. And it's one of the great comic performances by a comedian, by Ali Kemper, who plays Kimmy Schmidt. It's, uh, I don't know if you've seen Bridesmaids. She was Bridesmaids. Ali Kemper played the sort of cheery, unnaturally optimistic bridesmaid in one of the smaller <laughs> supporting roles. And this, is, and this is just a great example of taking an, an actor or an actress and just making a show that suits them perfectly and she just sort of sells every part of the role. And what about, for those of us who don't, say, have the streaming services yet, um, Transparent? What's, what have you liked so much about Transparent? Everything. <laughs> it's so good. For, what, it's in half an hour comedy drama it's the episodes feel so dense and like there's so much in them and then you get to the end and you're like how was that only a half hour episode um it's just so the depictions of the family um are just so real the characters from the pilot so it was picked up from so it was an amazon original and amazon did a bunch of pilots where they people voted and they chose that this was the show that they wanted to have made. So a couple of actors, I think only one maybe changes from that pilot into the rest of the, the episodes. Um, but it's just the way, like you could see why people chose it to get made from the very get-go. The writing is so brilliant. It's Jill Soloway, um, whose own father went through a transition. Um, so a, it's- A male female transition. Yeah, yeah, and it's just so 
so layered and so brilliant and unique and poignant and just also vis like visually beautiful. The use of colours and the aesthetics of the whole thing are just quite incredible. Because that's really one of the great changes. I mean, TV for so long was sort of the shabby little sibling to movies. And with, especially with the American cable shows, with the sort of budgets that a lot of these things are made on, they look like they have feature film quality production values. Something like Breaking Bad, I guess, was one of the first. That it just looks stunning. And, and that it's not something we were necessarily used to seeing in series television. Yeah. Well, I think we're only just starting to talk about the director's impact on television, you know, and we've all sort of gone through that decade of talking about the writer slash producer as being the key creative voice and, and thinking of the directors as almost a workmanlike role on television. But I think one of the things that's going to change with television with its growth is that the director will become, on a visual sense, more important again and will see more influence of the director, for better or for worse. But I think, you know, that's one of the things that television has, has coming for it is, is on that visual side is the director's impact. Because mm. it's really been thought of as a sort of writer's and producer's medium, hasn't it? Much more than a director's medium. Mm. That said, I don't know that TV necessarily has to be compared to cinema. It is its own entity and its, its own unit. So a lot of the times... So a lot of the conversation that people have around television, including ourselves, is what is quality TV? And it's these HBO kind of... Or a ACM and all these kind of really intense dramas, anti-hero, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but what about the sitcoms? I don't think there needs to be the binary of what is quality television when it, just because it looks beautiful and it might be highly dramatic and driven in a certain way. I feel like TV is so broad that we can't forget that there, there are amazing, like you were talking about Kimmy Schmidt, the likes of Broad City is just, it's just changed how people engage with television and that's a, a sitcom of two filthy women who I adore and... It's like it's just an amazing show, and I think that a lot of the time people like to promote the cinematic qualities of television without looking back at what TV. It's a populist medium as well. Like we can't forget to honour that. I Broad City is like the filthy uh, Mary Tyler Moore show, or, or Rhoda, or something for people <laughs> of, a, of a certain age. Which I think is a great development. Yeah, but also a really girls. good illustration of the diversity of where things come from now, mm -hmm. because it started as a. A, yeah. On the net, didn't it? As short episodes on the net. Which is what is TV anymore, right? So there's a whole bunch of web series that people still include, I talk about as TV. So High Maintenance, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, is probably the one that a lot of people will know. Um, it's about a pot dealer, but kind of not about a pot dealer. Um, and it's brilliant and it's just all online and you can pay for the second series now. Um, the rest of it was available for free. And they're just amazing caricature and character studies that go for anything from five to 15 minutes. Um, and I think that's talking to how people have different attention spans now. And so it's all kind of adapting in that way. It's not necessarily cinematic. I think it's taking it all in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. is all the best TV now American? Uh, no. I think, yeah, yeah, it wasn't. They're the kind of, oh, oh my God, no, I'm blanking. But all well, the, Orphan Black, you mentioned Canadian. Canadian, I guess. exactly. But then there I, was all of the, um, the fall, Nordic... Wolf Hall. Um, they're all like the, the Swedish and Danish. The Danish. Yeah. 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 Borgen. Uh, you know. The Killing, the Bridge. I think we are definitely predisposed to American television. I think that's one of the things that's going to happen with, with streaming services that are based in America. You know, we're going to get a lot of American voices on those streaming mm -hmm. services. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, the British are still there and they're still great things, but, I mean, they've got their own issues as well in their industry. I mean, you know, some British television is just dankly populist and terrible and lowest then, common denominator stuff. But then you have Black Mirror, <laughs> which is just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're probably getting near the point where we need to get ready to ask some questions or take some questions if you have any questions. There are people in black T-shirts with microphones who will be coming round. Um, so, yeah, put your hand up. They can see you and they can indicate to us. Hi, my name is Sharon. Hello, Dibby. Hello, Sharon. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Anyway. Um, no, I just want to know what your opinion is about the fact that, that there are certain TV shows that are completely 
changing casts from season to season. For example, Fargo, which the next season is going to be with a totally new cast, and True Detective. So the om like the Omnibus what, series, I think, is that the... I'd like to know what... American Horror about. Stories is another one of them. I think that's interesting in, the, in, in terms of the anthology um, the drama or the anthology show, yeah, because that's, that's yeah. one thing that we haven't really seen uh, in the traditional sense of, the, say, The Twilight Zone or Alfred Hitchcock Presents or those, those great anthology shows. And that says something about the, the kind of format that we're looking at now. It's so long form that it's, that it's an anthology season. So you watch the entire first season of American Horror Story and then Jessica Lange stays in the cast and then everybody else changes. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a sort of sign of the times. Mm. I kind of do, I, you know, I do like that, that, that Black Mirror style though when you've kind of got episode by episode by episode and the, and the really interesting thing and the respectable and ad admirable thing about Black Mirror is that, you know, e every episode somehow feels bound together but it's completely separate topic, which is the key, I think, to a good anthology mm. production. Th those anthologies remind me of the appeal of the miniseries. You know, it's a, that, it's a six or eight hour show. I, mean, I think True Detective, for example, was eight one hour episodes. And I, you know, it's, I think it's nice that you know, people are still going in with the idea of finishing because there's, there's nothing worse, I think, than a series where the creator is just carrying on season after season because they're just racking up the numbers and the commission and you know they're just going to syndicate the show one day so I, I think having an end point can still be quite good for in creative terms that said let's see how true detective keeps going you know the next one might just be holding on to that kind of oh it could be terrible like, but i'm glad i'm glad and the first american season horror ended. story has done its thing mm. before <laughs> you know it ended before rust became a weekly presence you know with these nihilistic homilies <laughs> but all, all we're really being know about it is it's going to be another detective story. You don't know anything. I mean, oh, true detective. Yeah, There's just a lot of staring. I think that's the teaser. <laughs> just a bunch of staring. I think I must be in the minority of I hated it and I'm not looking forward to seeing season two in the same way. I know lots of people thought it was wonderful. I was thought it was... I think Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson were given way too much rope and I hated it its attitude to women. So when I think of season two, I think, oh, I hope it's going to be really different because season one didn't excite me in that way. But it's And then you saw Vince Vaughn was in it and you were so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a lot to get me excited about season two, but I'll give it a go. Rachel McAdams is in it. She's and that, brilliant. that would be an incentive for me, yeah. absolutely. But the anthology series is just interesting as a phenomenon because it goes back to what you were talking about in terms of all the different places TV is coming from and all the different voices. Because the, the operative philosophy used to be you need a long run of something in order to get people used to it, to know that it's there, to bring them to it. In fact, now the great explosion has been the short run stuff because people will find it anyway or watch it on a streaming service or, I mean, I guess it's already old-fashioned to think by the DVD box set. But there is a feeling that word of mouth will bring people to it. So you can have six episodes or eight episodes and it'll still be... A winner. And the other great thing about that is it's the way that we're now engaging with television has brought back to life a lot of the shows that perhaps were cut off because of the ratings situation. So some of those are great, like Arrested Development. Some of them are questionable, like the recent announcement about Full House. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a weird climate. <laughs> oh, yeah, X-Files. Twin Peaks, who knows? But look, X-Files, we've just had a mention of, in terms of remakes, X-Files... I was incredibly sceptical of the idea of Fargo. It was, how can, why would anyone touch an adaptation of what was such a remarkable film and yet the TV series turned out to be pretty terrific. So maybe can't judge ahead of time. Um, other questions? Uh, yes. Thanks. Uh, uh, I'm someone who's been watching television in this country since it started 59 years ago. I still use VCR. Hmm? But look, what I've got to say is this is a dirty big elephant in this room. Artistic quality. Why are we not talking about this? I mean, there's so much crap uh, that, which happens to be dressed up and sold intensively and so on. But here's me big worry as someone who's concerned about, about the cinema. I, I don't accept what was said about the difference that, that, that you can bring a divorce between cinema and, and television. I don't accept it, but I guess it's a subject for big debate. But here's my problem. As I watch cinema and I see the debasement of directorial style, particularly of mise-en-scene, in cinema, and I see where it comes from, from television. 
The, 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 and I don't have to go into um, using um, stuff about classical narrative cinema and so on, not that, but this, that in television, for economic reasons, the kind of thing that, the, you know, that Charlie Marx would look at and say, of course, that had to happen, was to save money, to save costs. Um, the, the style of film directing was changed so that uh, framing was tighter. You rarely used two shots, that is, where two characters are in the frame and both of them can be seen by an audience uh, and in which both have something significant to say. Uh, all of that creates problems and the wider your take is and the more people that are in the take when you shoot, uh, the greater are the difficulties that arise later on for uh, continuity. And continuity uses up time and time costs money and so forth. So economic pressures, really, just really, as, as, as crass as that, as, as a quid, um, was the reason that directing styles changed uh, early on in television. Because the first directors were get, taking their ideas from cinema and they were pretty quickly, in England and America and then here in Australia, it happened even faster, that they just started to direct in this style. Now, that's all right to say that if you want to go back half a century, but what we're looking at now is directors of big-budget cinema um, who grew up watching television and so their sense of the basic grammar has been learned from television. Look, I look at an, a, an expensive film, one where you didn't have to worry about budget being the problem, an Australian film recently, Great Gatsby. Uh -huh. Most of us saw that, how bloody long it was, how much money was spent on, on, on production design and so forth in that. There are six two-shots in the entire bloody movie and only in one of them do both characters speak a sentence. So now, I mean, this, this, this form of debasement, and I want to say it's artistic debasement, it's got so great that even when directors in cinema have got the resources, uh, they have the ingrained sense of grammar that they got out of television mm. it means that their movies are getting worse. I, I, don't, I don't see the connection, I? actually, between... Uh, you talk about Great Gatsby. I don't, I don't think Baz Luhrmann mm. is influenced by television at all. Oh, um, he, but you, I, you mean he, he, he's only himself to blame for that, that style that he uses? Well, yes, he has himself to blame <laughs> and blame him we should. Yeah. Well, no, but, but if what you're yeah. saying is there's still a lot of really bad television... My eyes. Th well, there's always been a lot of bad television. There's mm. also a lot of really good television. There's always a lot of bad plays, bad books, yes. bad films. Yes. And there's always a percentage that make you realise what the possibilities of, of that art form or that medium are. I understand, but your speaker, one of your speakers this evening has mentioned the code. Now, I watched the code, I thought I'm interested in the script. They were so appallingly badly directed. Um, that, that there, were, there were no um, uh, establishing shots, for instance, so that you just jump from one scene to another. I found that made it move faster. Mm. But what does it make move? The narrative doesn't move faster because there's a degree of perplexity in there, uh, not, well, not always conscious, but it's there in, in, in the conceptual experience of the viewer. The result is you think that's moving faster because it, when you look at it on the page, there are fewer things being said. But in terms of what an audience can take from it, they're actually struggling to make sense of the next thing. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that that's yeah. true. I, well, then, then I have, don't have, have a look at an episode this of This might the be code. a agree to disagree because <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we disagree, but I don't think we want to have it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do All right. Okay. It might uh, be a matter of taste, I think. Then. Yeah, yeah right. it's taste. And that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're talking to someone who thinks that uh, Waking the Dead is the best show he's ever seen on television. That what is? Waking the Dead. Waking. Okay. With Trevor Eve, mm. the cold case one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. Oh, look, I'm sorry to do this, but I actually want to ask John a question. <laughs> I want to ask whether or not he has been happy with some of the recent ABC series because I think that a lot of them have been absolutely excellent, including Jack Irish. Were you happy with Jack Irish? Jack Irish works pretty good. Yeah. Oh, thanks, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, uh, right. did you count the two shots in Jack Irish? <laughs> there, are, there, there are quite a few, but have a look at it. When you're working on Jack Irish, you've got 40 odd people on the set, as well as the, the cast. The youngest person there is the director. Uh, and uh, so, no, Jack Irish works pretty good. But the code was something that came off. What's the other thing? Oh, yes. Um, what is it? Antac Girls? Now, one of the other things that comes through that kind of directing... Uh, I John, think, I, I think we better go, move on. Yeah, just get a few more questions in. I, I want to add one more point to this, though, please. And Very that is quickly. That, that actors, actors are learning to speak their lines sp line by line rather than to speak a continuity. And watching something like Anzac Girls, what do you get? But in every time you cut back to any one of the speakers, they're, they're up there with that kind of drive they've got because they were getting ready to speak their line. And that's okay. murdering it. Thanks. 
John. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Yeah, one here. Just, okay. It is a point about speed and economy in terms of delivery of uh, the telcos are making probably the most money selling us massive contracts of data allowance so we can watch what we want when we want. And I do wonder how the broadcasters are going to survive apart from the ABC and the, you know non-advertising stations, I'm not quite sure how, how many ads are it, uh, you get with Netflix. I bet there's a few. I haven't done the Netflix yet. Do you get ads with Netflix? I no. So, no. So yeah. I'm wondering, like, I want, I've seen the future. So there's Fox, right? There's Murdoch and he's a broadcaster, traditional sense. But then they, how do, they sell the wonderful new programs that are being delivered on demand... And they pay the people that are making them. Content's always king. We know that. But what are the telcos? Like, they're making all the money out of it because we've got to buy the data contracts to get... So there's going to be a gap in terms of, like, income streams back to... Possibly back to the production companies. Could we see in the future possibly, you know, a Telstra owning, you know, content directly? That's what my question is. Probably. Mm. If, if, if Amazon have content, yeah. I don't see why Telstra couldn't. But just on that point, I'm, I'm technically illiterate, but streaming isn't, doesn't use a lot of data, does it? It's not like you're downloading the show. Does? It uses a lot of data, but, but there's a lot of data caps that are completely unlimited now. Yeah. Mm. And we're already at that period now. My cap is unlimited. I don't know about this idea of Telstra ending up owning the, the industry. It's kind of like saying because, the, you know, the government is laying down the cars, they're going to, laying down the roads, they're going to own all the cars after a while. I've been... 60 bucks a month? But it's not to Telstra. But that's also... <laughs> <laughs> TPG? You're right in that they're definitely using it to bumper their sales. All of the ads on bus stops, tram stops at the moment, are IA net plus Netflix or blah, blah, plus Stan. It's definitely a marketing ploy for them, so I can see where you're coming from. And I think what I was trying to say earlier when I said that I overheard those two girls talking was that one of them knew what Netflix was and the other one didn't. And I think that we're coming from a position of a certain socioeconomic bracket. We're obviously critically and culturally invested in television. A lot of people won't be, like, in our position. So I think that... There are a lot of variables at, variables at play and what you present is perhaps mm. a chance, but we don't know. I mean, after all these years, I mean, what is it, 33% of Australians watch, have Foxtel, have exactly. pay, pay television? I mean, mm -hmm. all those years and still only a third of the population is committed to it. So. Well, the, the business model, it's, it's, it's adapt or the business collapses. It's always been that way. You know, about 10, ten years ago, we were paying $7.50 for an overnight rental from Blockbuster Video. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, that's half of Netflix for a month. Yeah. It's, a better, it's a better model. Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've got a question, Luke, for you. Um, you made a statement about, about ending episodes with, um, with cliffhangers um, being the, the style that's necessary... For Netflix, I would have thought the logic is it's the other way around, that mm. you need to have a strong cliffhanger for a weekly series to make sure that people still remember that they want to come back. Yeah, it's and both, that that yeah. button on, on Netflix m makes, makes the ends of programs possibly a bit lazy because you count on people not actually bothering to press the button. Oh, I don't know about that. I, I, think, I think the logic applies to, to both forms. I don't think you can just um, separate the platforms like that. Um, the interesting thing about the show I was talking about for Bloodline is the end of the first episode, I'm not going to tell you what happens, but it's an explosive finale that comes out of nowhere in terms of it's, it's not plucked from the, from the uh, timeline. So it's completely non-linear. So these guys have obviously felt a really big onus to go, bam, we're going to end with a massive cliffhanger. So there are always exceptions. There are always shows that do and that mm. don't. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to... To tell with a, with a you know sweeping kind of statement. House of Cards, for example, I think was one that didn't use a lot of um, cliffhangers, but it, you know on Netflix as well. Intrigue. So I think it varies. They yeah. have intrigue yeah. instead. Can I just say on on the note about Bloodline, I'm pretty proud of us for not spoiling anything. By the way, <laughs> you're welcome. 
But that, <laughs> <laughs> but th that has become a really difficult thing about talking about or writing about TV because so many different people are at different points in their viewing that you can't it's you can't give a, give away plot, mm -hmm. um, which is a challenge when you're writing about it. But how do you negotiate that? Is there a particular point where you say? it's been out in the public domain for long enough, I can now discuss it in that way or not? I think it depends on what you're writing. If you're writing recaps, they're going to spoil everything. It's yeah, quite, kind of different. If it's more of a long form, rumi like rumative thing that you're going to think about and bring out after the seasons have completed, <laughs> it's different. Um, people can get a little too tetchy, but I've also accidentally spoiled things with people in the past and felt incredibly guilty about it. So yeah. I don't know. There's a statute of limitations when it comes to spoilers. So, <laughs> you know, uh, we can talk about the end of the movie Gallipoli because we all kind of know what happened. Uh, when it comes to, say, uh, Better Call Saul, Better Call Saul or something like that, and it comes to writing about it and describing it, I like to do a kind of um, initial impressions write-up. So you, you might use the, the first two episodes. Don't explain. If, you, if you're using too much plot anyway, you're probably not doing a great job as a, as a TV critic. Uh, engage with the themes. Yeah, you mentioned some scenes and how they connect to where you think the show will go, and, and that's a nice way to, to introduce it. First couple of episodes, this is what mm. I thought. Mm. Yeah. We've probably got time for one more question. Yep. Yeah, no one's talked about anti siphoning and you, if that changed in any kind of real way what that might do and how the Australian industry might survive that change. Do you think it's likely to happen at any stage? Mm. Well, I think, I know Foxtel is pushing very hard to get the regulations relaxed and they're probably dealing with a government that's amenable to removing restrictions on trade and the huge driver of their subscriptions is sport and people have already demonstrated that if they're following a sport, they're prepared to pay to see it. So. I would think at this point the idea of the regulations being relaxed is not beyond what I see as possible. What do you think? No comment. <laughs> and I think just basically everything we've discussed tonight, you know, streaming services, pay TV, increasingly, and I think, you know, what's exciting people on free-to-air TV or that's being made locally, TV has been moving for more than a decade, probably since pay TV launched, towards the idea that if you really want to see it and see it in the way that you want, you're going to have to pay more for it. So I suspect the anti-siphoning laws will be relaxed in a way that reflects that. Yeah, but um, I guess that that's we've reached the end of our time. So thank you very much for coming tonight and hearing the discussion, and thank you to all thank our panelists. Thank you.